Hi everybody, welcome to the Digital Craft Festival. This is uh, one of the show and tell sessions that hopefully you'll be enjoying. There's loads of things going on. Uh, my name's Kate Strasden and I am Senior Lecturer in uh, the Fashion and Textile Institute in Falmouth University. Um, so I come at this from a, um, a, from a history angle and sort of cultural studies, but textiles and leather and is absolutely my thing. So I'm really delighted that there's um, some a whole group of lovely makers here who are going to talk to us today about process. We've, we've all got theme, different themes in each of the show and tell sessions and this session is thinking about some of the processes that make it, that are specific to makers because it's all about the storytelling and how makers, um, the thing that really, that sometimes we might not know about um, a maker's work. So I'm going to introduce you uh, one by one to everybody that we've got today. We've got um, Wolfram, Wolfram, how do I say your surname? Is it Lur? Lur. Lur. L-U-R. 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 Yeah. So Wolfram Lur, who's a Thank leather you. worker. Hello. Um, Hello. Andrew Parker, who is a weaver. Uh, mm. Heather Hancock, who does fantastic things uh, in 3D with textiles. Um, Hello. Charlotte Meek, who um, does crafting and workwear. Uh, Paula Eastman, who's a leather worker, and Jules Hogan, who's got some fantastic knit. So we're going to have a chat with each of you. We're going to start with Wolfram. Um, Wolfram, how did you get into what you were, how did you become, um, how did this kind of world of leather open up for you? Where did you start? Um, basically, I started um, as a shoemaker. As a teenager, I showed interest in, in handmade shoes and couldn't, um, couldn't find nice shoes to buy myself. And then when I became a, a young adult, I just um, thought to um, or showed interest to become a shoemaker and um, came to England, and I'm German, and found a friend of mine. She, she taught me how to make shoes. And then I just brought one, one of my masterpieces with me. And it's a, it's a show and tell. Um, this is really an um, integrate work. But also I, this um, it was quite complicated to sell um, handmade shoes in, in the industry. And then to support my shoemaking career, I started making bags, wallets, belts, and, and loads of um, different leather work. Um, nice. Yeah, this is, for example, here. It's just a, um, it's a notebook cover, and here is, uh, is, is my glass bag. Is, um, um, this is my Georgia, my Georgia bag, and yeah, that is um, I, I manage here with um, with a cut from the leather, um, a three dimensional. So I'm, I'm try to work when it's um, made in England, and then it needs to be quite simple. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that over the years, um, complicated work is really hard to sell. And then, mm -hmm. then I do wholesale as well. And then yeah. especially in the wholesale front, things need to be easy and straightforward. Mm -hmm. And recently so really I... Um, say again? Yeah, no, so it's really evolved. It's really interesting to see that trajectory of how it's evolved from, from your first interest in leather and how that's worked out into product now. Yeah, and then, um, like, last year, um, um, a teenager um, passion came back and I, to plants. I, I started frantically um, um, growing plants um, at home, uh, also in our allotment. And then I, I thought how to make, um, make it happen that I'm... Um, still doing leather work and combine it with plants and then I just um, have some um, developed some plant holders how you can see here mm. and they are they are my pick plant holders they go in a wall that's my um, my display and I have here some um, one hanging my, my workshop is really full with colors that's the reason it's not so easy to see maybe and but the interesting thing is then I'm I'm trying to then I, with wholesale in England, it's kind of, you need to be, things needs to be sought through, needs to be simple. And I used to do wholesale, travel to America, to Europe, and all my work I had with me was too complicated to wholesale. And then in the end, I just made it, and, and then wholesale give quite a lot away. 
and as a, as a maker yeah. it's really it's complicated then to earn money and then I um, like with this um, pig plant holder I, I developed a, um, an, a developed that and have now proper packaging and but everything is handmade and yeah that is what, yeah. what we are up to and then yeah amazing so it's yeah so it's that it's very interesting to see how you sort of tailored that to your market so angie how about you how did you get in because you've got those amazing neon textiles and um, how did you find your way into textiles um well i trained as a rug weaver in the early 1990s at cumbria college of art and had every intention of, of setting up a practice then and took a part-time job to support the practice working in the costume department um, in West End. And that turned into a 20 year career. Um, I ended up working as wardrobe mistress and wardrobe supervisor and touring the UK um, with shows. And during that time, I kept hold of my passion for weaving and developed my style. So I was never making for a market, yeah. um, hence the fearless color. Uh, and then uh, we had the opportunity to travel. So I lived in India a while as well, always still planning that the business would come one day. Uh, and then we had our children and that uh, having three kids quite close together, um, I stopped working in theater. I've moved to television as well, but the hours didn't fit with a young family. Um, so we just went down to surviving on my husband's income, which was an ideal time for me to start a business. Um, and so I fitted that around uh, the children well, before they started school and then once they were all in primary school the business started to grow uh, so that's a couple of years ago now and I've managed to stay true to these colours um, I still hand weave rugs but that as a business is quite a tricky one so I also design rugs which I have made um, and I'm working on a new product at the moment as well and another thing I make is um, because it's all about the technique, because it's about colour, scale, and the technique, uh, which is Krubrag. And so I hand weave these art panels as well. There you go. Um, which is taking, I know, do you want me to get rid of my head? <laughs> <laughs> but I um, use the rug weaving technique and take the scale right down to a very fine, um, you know, mercerised cotton. Yeah. So it's fine and intricate. And then I can, and, yeah, if we go back, to, I won't talk much more, but um, most of my design happens on the loom. I've managed to keep that playful element I had when I wasn't using my um, weaving for a business and, mm -hmm. and keep that in. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. So we'll come back and talk about your process in a moment. Um, Heather, moving on to you, how about you? Because I think you mentioned we, when we chatted the other day that this is a, a relatively new venture for you. Yes. Um, I originally trained in fine art, so really I, I suppose I'm a drawer and a painter. And then for a long career, I taught visual studies, A-level, and about three, 2016, um, I was coming, knowing that I was going to leave teaching, and I entered the Jerwood Drawing Prize, and amazingly, we were shortlisted that year. So that restarted my love of drawing yeah. which has always been there because I've always taught it but it's different when you're doing it for yourself mm. rather than giving all your ideas to the students mm. so from drawing and I don't know how well you can see that oh yes gorgeous so okay. yeah I try particularly during the lockdown to work in the sketchbook and so that's that's initially where my ideas begin i don't know how many pages you want to see because i could go on i love i love artist sketchbooks or, or you know I'll, makers makers I'll that down for a minute um, and then i'll say that the other thing that got me that i've always done with the drawing is is work from a collection and i've got lots of different animals creatures that i draw and then that has become something I decided when I'd got more time, when I'd left teaching, to start to make my own creatures. So I've got a lot of 3D animals, birds, that I've, I've tried to do in different ways. Yeah. They're all, those are 
constructed with the silk, um, pure silk. Right. And then I've also got things that I've tried for craft fairs, like the little bird on a stick, which is made out of calico and paper. And literally it's, it's drawn on the sewing machine and then just a little bit of watercolour. And yeah, obviously yeah. one takes a lot less time. So I'm, I'm trying out different things, hmm. um, basically to take to the craft fairs. And now the Bovey Tracy and the Cheltenham have been cancelled. So hmm. really I've had, I've had a lot more time to do more work and you can see, you know, the different yeah. metal brooches. And when it, when it comes to the process part, I can take you through how I actually make a medal. So that Great. was an idea. Amazing. Thank you, Heather. Um, so Charlotte, tell us about your, so you've got the kind of uh, that artisanal workwear um, thing going on. Tell us about that. Um, well, it, it came about because I was teaching knitting and sewing and I couldn't find a, an apron that I could get um, Handles and a ball of wool into. So um, my background is um, in textiles from when I was tiny. So I designed and made an apron and we had so many people saying, where did you get the apron from? That we made a few and sold them and it, it's just kind of evolved from there. So all the, we have about uh, six designs now um, and they've just evolved over the years with different people asking for different things. Um, and we work with a we work with UK manufacturers now sourcing our fabrics and we work with a lot of uh, makers as well. So that, that was the process I was going to talk through with you. Yeah, that great. That's evolved. Yeah. And it's so timely, isn't it? That kind of um uh, sustainable, long lasting um garment that yeah, fits with UK that. production. Yeah, we started using um the first statements we made were using my stash that I've had uh, that I collected when the mills shut down in Yorkshire because uh, mm. there was a whole swathe of, of mills that shut down when I came out of um, when I finished my degree so mm. I bought bolts and bolts so that they were in my attic so uh, we started by using those and we offer a 10-year guarantee as well so if anybody buys one of our aprons and um, for some reason the stitching comes undone which it very rarely does but mm. it does it back to us and we repair it free of charge so we've always been yeah yeah um and it's a it's a big part of our um our business really um mm. i think it's and also we, we produce in the, in the uk as well so we manufacture here we manufacture just down the road um we've got our own little production unit and and that's been really important because the the um paying a decent wage for a machinist is is paramount for me because it's it's such a skill and it's so underrated that that's why yeah. we want to produce here so we could control that as well yeah yeah fantastic thank you um paula how about you so what how did you get into um leather work was it, is it something that you did you did from college or where did it start um, no i i also started in theater so oh, I've also done wardrobe, wardrobe supervising, um, toured around the country, the West End, and I still work in the West End, obviously not at the moment, um, because I'm a startup business, I'm still balancing acting, you know, and then getting on with my other stuff in the meantime. Um, but for me, I started in shoes. Um, I got so annoyed with dancer shoes I was breaking, and being a little rubbish, that I was like, right, I'm going to do something about this. So I took myself off to college and did my diploma and my master's in shoemaking. Um, and then got work in sort of an orthopaedic specialist and kind of slowly fell out of love with it, actually. Um, and then fell back into wardrobe and then fell and did sort of lots of crafty stuff. I found I was really missing leather as a material and then decided that actually my love for bags was greater than my love of shoes and so took myself off to study again sort of over the country with different people short courses people that were willing to teach me um, and I've just spent the last three years really trying to get to grips with a new technique and making what just comes out of my brain really what I really love yeah and you know I like I think I like to sort of marry commercial 
design with traditional techniques, which doesn't always work. And I'm learning that as I'm going along. Um, I love a pocket. I like, I like plate things to put everything. And sometimes that's my enemy. So, you know, it is a big learning curve, but I'm really, really enjoying it. So that's, that's, that's brilliant. Where and that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? When you have that, um, you sort of learning as you make, which is, yeah. uh, you know, you have sometimes the actual, what you, think in your head is not maybe necessarily how it's going to work out that's yeah fantastic oh, thank absolutely. you no worries um jules so um how long have you been uh doing your knitwear production well i've um i graduated in 1995 and um for many years i worked for a design consultancy and there i um i worked with a lot with color and print design um, in embroidery as well. And so it's almost, I see myself as a multifaceted um, designer. So all of those elements feed into my work. Um, I actually started my, um, my own collection while working full time for a knit studio in London. So initially I, um, I was doing it at weekends and you know, in my spare time, and then I've slowly, um, it's slowly grown. And so now, you know, this is my full-time employment. And the idea for the collection, it's, it's, it's not purely about the garment or the textile, it's more about how it works with the body. And the yeah. main thing I wanted it to do was to enhance the body. Um, and especially as we get older, our bodies change, we might feel less confident about that. So the pieces enhance and almost um, contribute to the beauty of a person. Mm. So um, with lockdown, I've actually found it's given me the time to explore areas which I wasn't able to do before. So I've introduced some linen yarn into the collection this summer, which has um, been you know, quite well received. And I've been, and this is one of my my new linen scarves. Oh, gorgeous. This is a patchwork design. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're um, familiar with the work um, of uh, the Quilters of G's Bend. So they're actually um, in America. And right. it's a small, small area in America where these women make these patchwork quilts. Yeah. And it's really wonderful colour. Um, but I wanted to actually um, do it in my own way and um, increasingly um, being inspired by vegetal colour. So my yes. colour palette for the summer is very neutral. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, but then it, if it is a proper colour, it's still very um, muted. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is, this is a wrap that I actually launched this weekend. And um, it's got this ombre effect, which is a signature yes. look, which I, I always have in the collection of, you know, blending colours together. Yeah. That's brilliant. It's interesting, isn't it? Thinking about, with Charlotte saying about, um, you know, that kind of sustainable. And I think there's, it, with, all of, with all of these things, and I think post-COVID, that um, investing in things that work well in your case on the body for longer and that yeah. we see the value of those things that are really meaningful and made in the UK are, is is going to be I think a, a massively important um, factor of, of whatever happens in our post lockdown world. Well, that's something that I'm very very passionate about is actually um, because I uh, last year I actually started working with um, a mill um, in Nottingham and also I have a couple of uh, master knitters in um, in Scotland and yeah. so th it would have been so much easier to look at um, production abroad but I kind of wanted to almost help our economy and I mean mm. we used to have so many wonderful tradespeople here and you know an industry has been lost so it's almost like my little contribution. So, yeah amazing. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, that's, that's, a, a, that's a very lovely kind of introduction to you all. So um, if, I, if I go back to you all from about uh, process, because this is kind of the theme that we're exploring in this particular show and tell about a process that is part of your practice that, oh, we've lost Wolfram. Um, he might, uh, he's coming back, he's coming back. Um, So I'll come back to Wolfram in a minute, wait for his screen to rejoin. Um, Angie, if we go to you and talk about 
a process then because I think it is the whole thing about process is so interesting to people and I think it's one of the things I will from your back um I'm back oh that's good then I, I can't see anybody but as long as um, people can see me that, we that's can see you good. I'm going to talk oh, to Anne nice. quickly about her practice and then I'll come back to you. Um, so okay, a process, good. Angie, that really um, people may be not aware because I think that's, it's, it's, those are the things that make this world of craft and artisanship so valuable. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk generally about the process of rug weaving a crook ragged rug. So, uh, Krug bragd is um, it's a traditional Scandinavian rug weaving technique and when it's traditionally woven it's it's quite oh like a bare Oh sweater. this is nice. Uh... <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> uh, it looks quite like a bare sweater um, but I try and oh, wow. give it a um, contemporary feel with the way I use the colours and the patterns and elongating the patterns. I was going to be demonstrating at the craft festival and I was going to bring my loom along because it's so much easier to explain the process. Um, but for this technique, basically anybody who knows a little bit about weaving is you would pass a shuttle or three shuttles. You pass them three times to get one solid row of colour. And so that, that's how I, and I tend to um, build the pattern at the loom. So within the structure of Krug Brad, within the structure of the patterns, I can basically make it up as I go along. You won't see any of the warp, that's all hidden away. Ah. So, so I'll have three shuttles on the go with three different colours and they, you pass them in the same sequence, but you're covering different threads each time. And that's, okay. how, that's how I build the pattern up. Um, and those colours are so and, beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, that's, I mean, this is, this is a sampler that I, I wove mm. when I was working on Tommy in the West End in the early 90s or late 90s. Right. And that still feeds yeah. in now. Yeah, you can see it's really present in your, in what you're doing. It's still got that kind of connection. Yeah. And then, but also there's another rug weaving technique that I absolutely love, which is a, a block weave. So again, it's that same sort of element of, of just following the colour as I go along. So I guess, yeah. so the process, um, yeah, it's, it's like building colour by having these three different layers that I can keep building up all the time. Yes. Um, and reading reading the design, it's sort of, I've done lots of design before I start, I have a vague idea, but the process is, for me, is, is following what needs to come next when those colours come together. Okay, that that's really interesting. I didn't, I mean, I, I kind of imagine not, not being a weaver myself, I kind of imagine that you've got that, you've got a very kind of clear idea of how, the, how it's going to evolve or what the, what the plan is. So, so it's really quite um, spontaneous in that way. It is. I've been told many times I'm not a typical weaver. Weavers, weavers oh, okay. have, they're, they're methodical, they're planning, it's all about mm. the precision and the maths. Um, mm. But the techniques... The actual processes I do, I'm very on it. You know, you can't mess yeah. around with them. But the yeah. design, oh, it's just, I, it, that's what works for me. I think, and I think that's what makes my designs different because mm. I, I'm not um, a, a traditional or a typical designer. Yes. I like to, I like yeah. to make something more edgy. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Did that tell you the process really? <laughs> It, no, it's really fascinating, and I think that scan that sort of traditional Scandinavian aesthetic, where you've kind of that's built into it. You can really see those Fair Isle um, influences in that. But with the colours, then with those sort of neon colours that you've that you've also built into it, they they really look amazing. Yeah, this is quite. A, this is a one of the rugs that I'm just I'm keeping hold of this one, but it's. Yes. It, hopefully you can see how it's got the contemporary element as well as the traditional. But um, yeah, yeah I'm just sure that you know what I mean. And you can always, if you weave, if you have three shuttles with the same colour, you get a solid block of colour. It's only when you bring in right. the additional colours. And you can use, you know, oh, you, can have, you can have areas where you've just got two. So, so yeah, yeah. that's 
yeah really lovely and how big is your loom is it a big floor loom it is and i yeah. can't wait till we can do this in real life again because i will yes. have that in the marquee yeah. and people can finally people you know, can do it amazing so i'm making a video for the weekend as well so yeah I'll so be able to see it in action yeah amazing thank you angie that's brilliant now we appear to have lost wolf from temporarily so um heather can i move on to you and, and talk a little bit about your process then and, and some of the things that you uh some of that practice that you do well as I, i've said about the drawing it's that's the key starting point for me and i also was going to be demonstrating at cheltenham um so i thought i would have lots of stages ready to show people when they came along so I'll show you how I get that's the finished metal brooch right lovely these will be the stages that lead up to it so I hope these come out all right on the screen that's the initial yeah. idea the drawing a simple line mm -hmm. drawing and if I go back to the sketchbook you see where the idea has come from with mm. the in this case with the birds on the top but I've simplified it for the um, the craft fair so the next stage would be to draw it on the calico and then moving on from that and I would have been doing this on the day yes then I'd put in the color with watercolor the next stage yeah. and then on the sewing machine I, I stitched the original drawing line, so I'm, I'm actually drawing with the stitch. Mm. And then mm. the final stage is where I put the needle and thread and stitch in the colours yeah. to, to the extent that I feel that I, I want to do on that piece. Or brooch is an individual piece made of the silk thread, and they're all yeah. stitched, but some of them, like this snow goose you can see he's stitched through all the way through yeah. he would have taken a month or two months it's difficult to say because i pick them up and put them down whereas yes. the mess brooch is one that i could probably make in a day okay so although so it's is it freehand so it's freehand how do you describe it is it freehand machine embroidery where you're using the machine but you are it's very much that kind of um now, this this metal brooch and the only the outline is on the machine the black i see and then the rest of it is hand stitched is is hand stitched with the silks because yes, yes. these silks are quite thick so they they won't actually go through my oh, I I an ordinary sewing machine you see yeah, so yeah. you couldn't do it but the bird is is literally there's a needle and thread that comes in and out of the yeah and they take the longer time as would the, the three-dimensional ones although they've got a, a soft wool stuffing to give them the, the form the mm. detail on the head well maybe maybe a month again to get to that stage wow. so the the three-dimensional things are much more time yeah, time. So look, yeah. i tried to invent things that i could take to the craft fairs that would would be just take you less time really so yeah, there's a, yeah. a big variety so there is that you've got that variety of process and type of object that that meets lots of other different things yes yeah so hopefully there's something for everybody really mm -hmm. to choose just either you know very mm -hmm. sustained pieces or mm -hmm. quite quite quick pay pieces yeah so, and i think the stitching is so interesting that the, the kind of i think stitch is something that often um really fascinates uh people watch it i know when i go to the the craft festival and you see people stitching at that it's part of those processes that are really um that really fascinate people so thank you heather that's brilliant thank you um wolfram should we should we talk about your process or well, my work i um you you have um, in leather work you have um, um, the edges can be folded edges and can be also raw edges that you see basically the um, the edge of the leather and my work is quite a lot that um, that I see the raw edge and 
and I, um, a guy worked for me years back and he said, oh, Wolfram, come on, let's, let's make your, your, your edges really nice. And I never made, made really an, an effort more into stitching. And since then, I really mastered it. And then to make, make the edges really nice, then, mm -hmm. then I, I found that the, if the people pick up, especially that you can't really see that on, online, but in, on graph spares, that's the reason we are, we are quite like to travel the, the country to show our work in person to the people and that they pick up a product and they see really, oh, this is really beautiful. Then I, I'm not, I'm really, this is an edge beveler and I'm, I'm taking the edge off of each single product, make it more round. Uh, you see here that it curls up and, and then I have a sander, but I can't show you that now. Then it's my, yeah, no, my no, that's work. No, but, but you I can see that. So hold it just slightly further up so you can see it. So it's that, yeah, um, but it's see. super sharp, presumably, then that just the way that yeah. the leather came out. Yeah, then there. I, on, on this, for example, this is a raw edge. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I prepared it already. It's already sanded and, and the edge make it round and then, then did some um, acrylic edge um, um, to make it really beautiful. And this is for us really important. And but we work a lot with, um, or entirely with um, sustainable vegetable tanned leather. Um, okay. it, we are we are not having any grown tanned leather. Then our company more and more goes as well. Like I think more or less every company just go or tries to do their work as sustainable as possible. And last mm -hmm. year, I just had a little bit of problem to be a leather uh, person. Then the leather comes from, obviously, um, we work with cow leather. But then I went to, um, to um, a sustainable leather forum in Paris to get more knowledge about, about the leather. And there, basically, I, I really needed that to see the industry that they tell me a little bit what... Um, well, I was a little bit confused. Why is leather sustainable? And basically, I, I learned um, in this forum they are they they have to do quite a lot of the more and more people in the craft scene as well ask me where the leather comes from. And we are now we only work with leather where we exactly know where it comes from. And if I'm buying, for example, shoes in the industry, I want to know where the leather comes from. And this is a really Im important process for us. Yeah, amazing. And I think that's true of everyone. I think it's a theme that's emerging, isn't it? That this idea that we all value, uh, we value the process, we value the time that it takes because everything that you're doing is so um, customised. It's, it's a very individual process. But then also that that contributes to um, local economies and sustainable practices. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And I don't really want that anything or um, people said, why are you not getting it produced in China? I said, but no, I, I wanted to have it as local as possible. And we kind of would like as well to work with local farmers and just to stay. I think through the um, pandemic, it gets, everything gets more local anyway. Yeah, 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 for, for sure. That's, that's really true. Thank you, Wolfram. That was brilliant to see that. It's fantastic. Uh, Charlotte, tell us about a process then with your, with your amazing workwear. Um, well, I was going to talk about how we, um, how we collaborate with, with different um, people. So um, we, we um, in the last 12 months, we started working with um, UK manufacturers. So we, we've um, approached them uh, to uh, specifically weave fabric for us so that we um, we stand out from other apron makers or other workwear manufacturers because there's a lot of um, workwear in the UK but we specialize in workwear specifically designed for crafters so we work with um, County Brook in uh, Lancashire and this yeah. was one of the first aprons that we did with them which is um, which was basically designed for gardeners um, so it's a it's a twill weave um, and then we've added the leather strap as well so we work with um, Kathy Edwards who's a, a leather worker in Hebden Bridge which is just um, over the hill from us so she right. does all our, our leather work so that was the first uh, fabric we did and then um, colours are orange 
this is the the fabric that they've just done we've done a denim and then we've done this orange twill which um is just lovely and it it it, it just um just highlights everything that we do so it's locally manufactured it's mm. made locally and we've been looking at diff putting different straps on so um i've discovered this which is elastic which i'm so wow, excited wow that's about. amazing so, and it, we, we're constantly looking for, for new things to do so this will be made into braces with by kathy and then we'll yeah. be added to the apron and the idea is that you can have interchangeable straps because at the moment our straps are um are fixed um, we do some with dungaree clips, but most of them are fixed. So this is a, a new departure for us, and it's kind of adding a, a new dimension to what we do. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've done uh, some limited edition printed aprons. So this is when we did some of these for the Great Northern last year. So we did we had a, a tan with a black print, and then we had uh, these bright ones. <clears throat> and we collaborate with other makers as well. So this was done by Modern Floss. Uh, so she, we, I gave her one of our aprons and she came up with this, which um, says not your average on it. And she's picked up some of the, the leopard print as well. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things I really like is, is working with different makers to do something that's uh, really quite different uh, to showcase their skills. Um, and these um, then become part of our range on our website. So we worked with um, Ben at the Owlery, Owlery Prints as well. We've done a range of aprons for him. Um, and we've got a couple of questions as well. For me, that's um, part of the joy of working in the world is that you get to work with these amazing people and do really beautiful products on something that is quite basic, really. Mm -hmm. No, that's amazing because I think the, the collaborations with other makers is, is fantastic. The actual um, trying to uh, kickstart some actual textile production again is... Uh, a great kind of initiative but also yeah, I think work workwear is is just it's kind of central to all makers it's the it, do you I imagine get quite attached to workwear anyway when it's so central to what you do every day yes yes and we work really closely with um, Make It British who support yeah, UK manufacturers we've been um, linked with them for, for about four years now and also the UK FT so um, we support them in training uh, machinists as well to a huge uh, lack of machinists in the UK at the moment and they're trying to get machinists back into the industry or training new ones so we do quite a bit of work um, with that as well because it's it's a it's a really important skill and it's so undervalued um, our, our, our aprons are aren't the cheapest around but we, we pride ourselves on the, the, the fabrics that we do the, the, the you know who makes them who we work with um and we try to to put something special into to what we do something of, yeah. something of um something of us and some of the people that we work with as well and i think with slow fashion and textiles generally it's that awareness that um that we don't want to buy cheap anymore do we we want to buy quality and we want to buy story and we want to buy makers and and people that we um can actually build a connection with so that's amazing it, it, it's also having something that, that really works we really think through the designs of the aprons that we make um and we have different designs for different different uh different disciplines and if somebody wants something in, in particular uh then then we can do it for them you know we, we don't go well no that's that's our aprons we say we yeah. need a pocket here if you want a massive pocket on the chest we'll put a massive pocket on the chest for whatever you want so it's got bespoke written all over it yeah yeah because they're made here yeah, they're made by us so it's yeah. it's really easy for us to move things around yeah have that conversation amazing yeah. thank you charlotte that's really fantastic um so moving on um paula with your lovely bags behind you um tell us a bit about your process one of your processes okay well um where to start really, I'm, I predominantly use vegetable hand leather as well because I like the way it feels, what you can do with it. Um, I also like using companies within the UK. So I've spent the last three years obviously finding my my way of working and improving on that to the point where I join you guys at Bobby Tracy next year. Hooray, very excited. Yes, yes. Um, 
but also, you know, using, so my linings um, for some of my bigger bags, I use Hainworth Wool, and they're a UK-based company, and I'm trying to use uh, foundries in the UK, so in England, so my hardware, I know is solid brass, it's hopefully going to last a lifetime, which I hope my bags will as well. Um, so that's kind of all become very important to me as I've gone through, you know, I think, like I said earlier, with the shoes, they were falling apart, they weren't very well made, and so for me, it's like, and I think as you get older, you want something that's going to last you. You want to know that sustainability is there. So that's become a massive thing for me as well as, as all mm. the other makers. Um, so my process is, I was going to talk about um, saddle stitching and how a huge amount of thread goes into a very small amount of uh, stitching, which I'm sure okay. you can back me up on. Um, so yeah, first of all, yeah. <laughs> So first of all, I mean, it's quite a long process, you know, it's not, it's very different to machine stitching, you know, which has its place. But for me, I find it very calming and relaxing. And I just love the look it gives. And I love that it will last a lifetime, you know, in theory, as long as you've got a good thread. So for me, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if you can see that tiny little mark here that gets scratched. Can you see that? If you hold it, hold it slightly closer if you can. Can uh, you see that? Yes, I can. Mm. Uh, yeah. 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 Just about. So There's it's very a tiny small. little scratch mark along the yeah. edge. Yes, and yeah. then you use, well, you use your wing dividers for that. So that creates yeah. your little mark along the top. Right. And then you get another tool, which is called a pricking iron, which is a bit like a giant fork or a mini fork. And that creates the little marks for yep. you to put your all through. So that doesn't go all the way through the leather. And then you use your all, and you, you go all the way through. So you have to make sure it's all very straight. Otherwise your stitching on the back goes all wonky, which has taken me an age to perfect. And even now it goes awry and I have to start again. So you can see now that that's on the front and on the back. Yeah. And then this, you normally, you can go anything from, I think I'm writing this, back me up well from, that it's normally three to five times the length of the piece you're going to stitch. Yes. And then plus some, so you're not butting, so you've got room to manoeuvre. So for that tiny little bit of leather there, you've got two lengths there. And it's one long length of thread. Mm. So a continuous piece is weaving in and out and creating strong stitch which is different to machine because the machine will bring a thread down and catch the one underneath but that doesn't actually feed back through that's what gives it its strength and the process still goes on I'm afraid so once you've done your stitching it down so you get a nice flat row and then as about the edges get beveled and sanded and then as a final thing I mean I use for mine I think everyone every I think leather work has their own special mixture and process of doing their edges and then it all gets yeah. finished off that way and that for me was quite a shock from being normally a machinist working in in wardrobe you know and in, in theatre to suddenly doing everything by hand and how long that process mm. takes but how mm. satisfying it is and knowing that that process is giving the customer something really I don't know, really unique and perfect. And, but you can also, you know, if you get the odd off stitch, which hopefully you don't, mm. it just shows how it is handmade and it's, it's a one-off. That, that one piece of stitching is, is unique, isn't it, I think? Yeah. Which I think is lovely. It is. And I think, I think that's another brilliant thing to remember is that what people are buying is that time. And these, this is why I think process is so interesting. We, you know, as, as consumers, don't always get that chance to understand where you're, it's not just the skills you know and the expertise that you've built up, but it's the time it takes to, well, to just, do something like that. Just an example of time, just for this little clutch bag here, that's seven hours and predominantly a lot of that is just stitch time and obviously yeah. punching all the little stars, but you know, and. It is. It's amazing how how long it takes. Mm, mm. But I just think the look of it is is so beautiful compared to yeah. other forms of stitching. 
but that's a very personal thing. No, it's amazing. Thank you. That's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> um, so Jules, you've been um very patient, last but not least. But um, uh, let's hear about because I mean, you you explained a little bit about some of the ways that you work. But what um sort of have you got a favourite process or what's your are you hand are you hand hand knit or machine knit? I'm machine knit. I can hand yeah. knit, but my love is machine knitting. Yeah. I just love the process of actually working with the machine. Mm. Um, sometimes it can be frustrating when, you know, the yarn gets caught and, you know, the knitting might fall off or you might get a hole. But when it works well, it's, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I thought I could explain a little bit about the process that's used to knit this scarf. Um, and it's yes, so that's fair, gorgeous. It's called a ferrule um, technique. Um, and so I, also, I start here, which is the cast on. And then, so for each block, I actually have to change colours. So it's not a case of setting up the machine and it just knitting. You actually have to physically work with the machine. So you select... Um, you know, you select a different colour for each section. Well, actually, it's two sections um, for each block. Mm. So um, my machine is an electronic machine. So I can actually program my own patterns into the machine. And then it will work out the repeat um, for me over um, its 60 needles. The, re the repeat is 60 needles, but you can have any length of... Actually, no, I'm just trying to think. No, sorry, 24 needles, 60 rows. Mm, so that's, right. that's the area that I can um, do my pattern over. Um, and the yarn that I've actually um, used for this piece is from a, um, a mill that sells surplus yarn. So there's so much, um, you know, yarn available. Um, it's almost like dead stock. So this is also something which I, you know, felt was, you know, very important to do is use existing yarn that's available as opposed to using new yarn that's being manufactured. Mm. And um, generally my ideas start with a sketch, you know, with an idea, and then the ideas are actually drawn onto graph paper. And then from then I can actually input it into the computer of the knitting machine. Amazing. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, the idea of machine knitting, that actually you are, you're absolutely kind of embedded in the process. It's not yes. just a case yes. of, let it go and do its thing you, you yes. you're it's a really important you've got your concept you develop the design you have to work with the machine to develop the piece and so yes. that's that's a really um the, the skill level and the process is really fascinating because I, I actually um one of the things which i say about um the knit where is it is handcrafted mm. and quite often people think of that as being purely hand knitted mm. but the hand is used so much within the whole process from start to finish from the designing the actual knitting of a piece uh, everything has to be washed and dried the label sewn in so yeah. it, you know ha you're using a machine as a tool yes but it's purely that you still actually have to operate it and you know it's still an important part of the process yeah yeah i was just about to say actually the machine is a tool in the way that we've yeah. seen other tools here like yeah. the loom is a tool and and that the, actually the machine is a tool and it's part of your craft yes. um, as you're designing yeah 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 amazing um oh, it's so it's so brilliant i've so enjoyed um talking to you all about the things that just make your work so unique. Um, thank you everyone very much for joining in today. Remember we will have in the, you'll be able to find all of the makers, their websites, um, Instagram handles, all of those things um, at the end of this um, show and tell and via the Craft Festival uh, website. So thank you so much everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for having thank, us. Thank you. Yeah, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.